wait for the first thing. Anyway, just a few of announcements. Number one, somebody has provided refreshments for us after the service, and so please feel free to go over and partake of the refreshments. The second thing is, if you're in a place where you can't see the songs, my wife Sue right there has extra song sheets that she could give to you. Just raise your hand and... and He'll help you. She's a wonderful help. And also, the other thing I wanted to mention was we we have a I don't know what I've done with it. We have a sign-up sheet. Oh, here it is. That's on the bulletin board, and this is some of the areas that we need help in. We need greeters. We need ushers. We need uh, Sunday morning, and and we're starting our culture awareness uh, sessions in about two weeks, and so we'll need set up for that. So we need volunteers and uh, set up and take down. Uh, we need musicians and singers, and the deal there is you show up at nine o'clock, and Tanya will get you going. And we need readers. We need uh, cleanup and maintenance people to do washrooms, bodega, plants, that kind of stuff. We also need uh, sound, PowerPoint, computer knowledge, uh, photocopying. We've got that filled now, so I won't mention that one. Anyway, and if there's nothing, if, there's, if there isn't anything on the list that you're interested in, ask me. I will put you to work. <laughs> somehow or another, for God will, not, a, not me. What else? We will begin. Lord God, thank you for today. Thank you that we can uh, come here and worship. That's what makes our hearts sing, not only while we're here, but when we leave. Thank you that we can come here and hear your word and give us a, a mind to understand it and a heart to accept it and legs to carry it out. Strengthen all those parts we pray today. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we'll have our first uh, reading and Herman's going to do it. It's uh, Jeremiah 31, 23 to 34. Good morning, everyone. Great to see you all. Jeremiah 31. When I bring them back from captivity, the people in the land of Judah and its towns will once again use these words. The Lord bless you, you prosperous city, you sacred mountain. People will live together in Judah and all its towns, farmers and those who move about with their flocks. I will refresh the weary and satisfy the faint. At this I awoke and looked around. My sleep had been pleasant to me. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will plant kingdoms of Israel and Judah with the offspring of people and of animals. Just as I watched over them to uproot and tear down and to overthrow, destroy, and bring disaster, so I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. In those days, the people will no longer say, the parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Instead, everyone will die for their own sin, whoever eats sour grapes. Their own teeth will be set on edge. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. Good morning. So good to see everyone here. Wow. <laughs> um, 
would you stand as we worship in song?
We need your presence in our lives, Lord. Holy Spirit, we need you each and every day. We need you to live within us and to be with us, Lord. reclined at the table and he said to them I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer for I tell you I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God after taking the cup he gave thanks and said take this and divide it among you for I tell you I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes and he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. The word of the Lord. Thanks to God. Thank you, Lord. At this time, we'll take up our offering. and we'll sing the talks all over the
these gifts. We thank you for the givers. We thank you, Lord, that uh, this is your church and you have placed us in a position to minister your love no matter where we live or whether it's summer or winter, whether it's Mexico or Canada or the United States. We, we just thank you that uh, we are to be that light upon the hill, the ministers of your love. So Lord, give us eyes to see. We thank you that we have the light knowing, Lord God, that what we do see will be where it's needed. And that's our prayer, that we can do your will. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. David's going to do our third reading. Reading from Hebrews in this text. <coughs> Hebrews is saying that Jesus is a high priest connecting Jesus and his revelation and his covenant to the ancient covenants. I'm going to repeat verse 6 when I come to it. Now the main point of what we're saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by a mere human being. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. And so it was necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already priests who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. Again, but in fact, the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is mediator is superior to the old one, since the new covenant is established on better promises. For if there had been nothing wrong with that first covenant, no place would have been sought for another. But God found fault with the people and said, The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. I will, it will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they did not remain faithful to my covenant, and I turned away from them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will establish with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my laws in their minds and write them on their hearts. I will be their God, and they will be my people. The word of the Lord. I, uh, I've been studying these passages for a couple of weeks, and I just picked up something that David read. And it was a part that was kind of missing in the message I was going to share with you today. But, you know, when we think of this covenant that God made with us, the covenant was okay. That wasn't the fault. The problem was the people. And I just picked up on that just as you read that passage in Hebrews. And uh, it just kind of helps bring it all together. So uh, thank you, Lord, for your word. At this time is our time of petitionary prayer. And I wanted to mention to you, too, Sean is here, I believe. Sean, would you stand up? You and Ken, husband and wife. And uh, we often, you know, the God's house is a house of prayer. And if you have prayer uh, that's a concern or anything and you'd like prayer after the service, feel free to go up to Sean or Ken or myself or Sue, and we will pray for you. 
and uh, I thank your business to the New Year's Eve fireworks. And <laughs> so I guess our prayer is everybody's safe, nothing burns down. But you know what, it's a new year. And often people, when they see a new year, they think, well, this is something that I can, I can start out new, <laughs> on a new foot. Maybe there's something last year that uh, you weren't so proud of that you don't have to do anymore. And uh, I don't know what it is. But I do know that God's there to hear what our requests are, no matter what they are. And that he will answer them, each and every one. I think it's important uh, now that if we pray for a new year, we pray for somehow for God to minister to those that are at war with one another. Give them wisdom, especially the leaders in Israel and Palestine and Russia and Ukraine and the countries in Africa that are not at peace with one another. We pray for the churches that uh, no matter where they're at, that they can be an instrument of peace in the communities that they live in. And I'm sure that there's even Christians that are embedded God has placed in Palestine, and Israel, and Ukraine, and Russia. Pray for those churches, those pastors, those people of God that uh, are doing God's will in those areas. Let's pray. I'll just take a moment to. Uh, that we can pray silently if we have something that's on our heart that we need to lift to God, that we can do that, knowing that he will hear that. Let's pray. God, I'm thankful that you can get all of this sorted out, that you have a plan that uh, one day there won't be wars, one day there won't even be rumors of wars, one day there will be peace. But in the meantime, Jesus reminded us that in this world we will have trouble. But he reminded us to take heart that he has overcome the world, that we can come to him in his name and he will look after our needs. We pray for the needs of the churches throughout the world that you'll bless them today and every day. Bless the pastors and the leaders, those that minister your word, your word of hope, peace, joy, and love, that the world can experience that through their word, through your word, Lord God, through them. You are so amazing. Thank you, Lord. And as Jesus called us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, stand up and just pray for this time of our service as I speak from the Word of God. I appreciate that. I have a Father, we thank you for this wonderful day, O oh Lord. Thank you, Father, that you gather here and worship you, O oh Lord. Praise you for your goodness and your mercy to us, O oh Lord. Oh, Father, we just you know the sins of the many, but your mercy is more. So we gather together at the end of this year, O Lord, we just look forward to a new year, Father. Pray, O oh Lord, for those, Father, that are grieving lost ones, Lord. Mm -hmm. Pray, Father, for those that are sick, O oh Lord, and downcast this day. O oh Lord, just thank you, Father, that our praise and worship, and everything that we can bring you is washed in the blood of the Lamb and made perfect before you, O oh Lord. And the Lord, we have 
come before you in your righteousness and you have given us our dress, Lord, for you. Bless this day, Lord. Glorify your name in all things you have. Your Christ Jesus. Amen. 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 I ask uh, in the church I used to pastor, I asked if somebody would stand up and pray for the message. I don't know, it must have been five minutes. <laughs> Nobody stood up. And as much as I wanted to interject and stand up and not pray for myself, but just begin, a little lady that <laughs> attended the church, she stood up and said, well, if nobody else is going to stand up, I will. And I said to her, I said, so you're the one that's going to pray. She said, well, of course I will. And there she went. This uh, message today is on the covenant. My grandson would say, boring. <laughs> but it's one of the foundations of our faith. And, uh, and the reason that I would, I had thought about speaking about the covenant today was the fact that Jesus said that in him was a new covenant. A new contract of love and peace that uh, God would establish for all of us. <coughs> because the old covenant, it was like David read in Hebrews, there, the fault wasn't that the covenant wasn't any good. The problem was with the people. You know, when you think about covenants, I did, a lot of this I wrote down just so I could get through it and not go off on any rabbit trails. And understanding covenant and the need for a new covenant. And so, first question is, what are we, or what is a biblical covenant? Good question. I'll try to answer it. Biblical covenant is different than a covenant that we would have here, say, on earth, or a contract, or marriage, vows, or any of that. A biblical covenant was solemn, it was binding, never to be broken. From God's point of view, he would never break it. It was an agreement that binds God to his children. An agreement that would bind them together. And it's interesting, we're recipients of this covenant. This covenant that God handed down to Israel through Moses. It was a unilateral Covenant, meaning it was from God to us. It was an agreement that would uh, put the onus on us. God wouldn't let down his part of the bargain, but it was up to us to try to fulfill what was meant in that covenant. Today, in this world, we don't have that unilateral God to his people covenant. It's a, I guess, what do you call a bilateral? It's between two people. A marriage covenant, for instance, is between two people. A marriage relationship is usually between two people. But it's not binding. <laughs> It is in some areas, but in some instances it's not. And usually it's destroyed by one word, and that's sin. Worldly covenants and contracts and marriages and agreements, legal agreements that are made up by lawyers, they're drawn up, they're drawn up arrangements that are bilateral between two parties. But we all know nowadays that anything goes. And it does. Anything goes. And that's sad, because that isn't like biblical covenant. Biblical covenant is beautiful. It's binding. 
It's full of love and full of grace. It's full of forgiveness. If only we had some of those aspects in our agreement on this earth, I, I believe it would be a better place. I, I thought that Israel and Hamas were under a peace agreement. Nah. God's covenant relationship was more than a legal contract. It was his way of loving and redeeming the lost. Mending the broken relationship since Adam. Actually, probably one of the, I'm going to talk about who God gave covenants to, just a list of them real quickly, but a lot of people seem to think that Adam and Eve were the receivers, the recipients of the first covenant when he said, don't eat these fruit from that tree. Adam and Eve said, well, who said so? The devil said to them, you know, who said you could eat? Well, if you eat that, it's going to be good. You'll enjoy it. What a mess they made. I don't know why when they were walking out of the garden, they just didn't make up their mind then and say, let's go back and apologize. <laughs> but that covenant, the first covenant was broken. And it left, left us with living in a world of sin and loss and despair, one that we couldn't mend, one that we found out that even God's covenant with his people couldn't mend, that God's covenant relationship was more than that, though. He was a God that wasn't going to give up on his part of the deal. God would express his love to them to all of us in Christ with forgiveness, with everlasting life, with a life of peace that would include having fellowship with God. God's covenants, in fact, when you look at the Old Testament covenants and the New Testament covenant that Jesus talked about, God's covenants made the two one. God's covenant was fulfilled through Jesus Christ. Who did God make his covenants with? Good question, Pastor L. I'll try to answer it. And I say, I just have a list. He made a covenant with Noah after the flood. Remember that? The rainbow in the sky. And never again would he do that to the creatures on this earth that he created. He also provided a means of peace with Moses. I mean, with Noah. With Abraham, it's interesting, he made a covenant with Abraham about circumcision. <coughs> well, you think, that's a weird covenant. But when you think about circumcision, and you start to look at the Hebrew uh, language and what it, what it was talking about, it was talking about Abraham's seed through circumcision, yes, that would be carried down the line of Israel and God's people, but it was also the seed. It also, he was childless. <laughs> but yet, God provided a child for him and Sarah. And so the covenant of circumcision and the offering of his seed that would bless the people of the world and the people of the world could come to God and come to know God was very important. He offered a covenant with Isaac, Abraham and Sarah's son, and Jacob, grandson, Moses. This is interesting here, the covenant that he gave to Moses was uh, the tablets of the covenant law. Their law, thou shalt not. <coughs> and it's it, it, too, you know, when you when you look at it, you begin to read it, he, he etched that covenant out with his finger in stone. And this is very important to when we look at the new covenant and God's promise of the new covenant. I'll point that out in a minute.
but he etched it in stone. There was a mediator of that covenant too, one of the first times, and that was Moses. Moses, he, he didn't like his job. <laughs> he didn't like standing on the corner and telling people that they're bad. <laughs> Who does? But he had a tablet that was written in stone and he was the one that was a mediator that said he was supposed to let the people know what God said. God has said this. Finger engraved. There was an Ark of the Covenant. Remember hearing about the Ark of the Covenant? What was that? Well, I'm glad you asked because I looked it up for you. The Ark of the Covenant. You think, what was the Ark of the Covenant? It was like Moses' Ark? No, it was a box. It was covered in gold. And it was on the altar in the, in the holy place with the tabernacle, usually. And it had three things in it, three main things. And it's interesting when you look at this Ark of the Covenant, what would be in it? What would, what would you put in your special treasure box? If you had to pick three things, what would be in it? Well, God picked three things that he put in there that were very important to the covenant. The first thing was that he put in there manna, bread from heaven that fed them when they were in the desert, <coughs> fell from heaven. And it's interesting when we look at Jesus, the Messiah, the bread of life, the one that has come down from heaven and said, I am that manna replaced. <laughs> What else was in there? Aaron's budding staff. I doubt if it buzzes anymore in the, in the little box. It might have, I don't know. Maybe if they would have asked it to do something, it might have. If they would have faith, it might have. But it was in there. Why was it in there? Because it reminds the Israelites that God could do anything. He could not only free them from the Egyptians, but if they didn't have water, there would be water that poured from a rock if they didn't have bread and bread and manna would manna and quail would be come from heaven. I had a friend one time that his wife was a wonderful believer. This I, I it should go off on side trails, but I always reminded of when he, he talked about quail. And he and his buddy were up in the mountains on a pack trip and they hadn't had much luck and they thought well at least they could catch a fish or maybe shoot an elk or a moose and they'd have a little bit of meat but they ran out of food and so my buddy he says to his wife to his friend he said i don't know what we're going to do we better leave and his buddy says well why should we leave he says your wife's a christian what would she do he said well she'd pray and he said he said well let's pray he said, oh, that's silly. You don't just ask God to provide food for you. And his buddy said, well, we're not doing very good right now. So he said, okay. God, my wife said that you will provide. And all of a sudden there was a ptarmigan that fell out of the sky in front of him. And he got up and he said, Somebody did that. <laughs> and so he went one way and his buddy went the other way and they walked through the willows and alders and no. They sat down and they, do you think God did that? Well, my wife says he does. <laughs> I'll never forget that. My friend became a Christian in the last week or two of his life. And I'm sure that uh, that was when he knew somebody didn't throw that ptarmigan out of the wills. I got off track tonight. The last thing that was in the Ark of the Covenant were the stone tablets or part of them, we don't know for sure if it was the entire law of God or if it was just broken bits and pieces. But the importance of having God's word.
the word is near you, it was said, of Christ. It was important of having the word of God always with us. Actually, I just wrote a little side note down here. The bread actually signified the lasting and the everlasting sustaining covenant that God would always provide. He made a covenant with David. It's interesting, the covenant he made with David was that his throne would always be handed down through his lineage. That there would always be someone on the throne from the line of David. That was a covenant that he made with David. And of course, if we read Matthew, the beginning of Matthew, we realize that that lineage went all the way from the very beginning right through David and down to Christ, through Joseph. And then he gave a covenant to his son, Jesus. He gave him the new covenant. The New Covenant. I wrote this down. This is what Jesus said. It was read in one of the scriptures today already. But uh, Luke uh, 7, 17. After taking the cup, he gave thanks, and he said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink it again until the fruit of the vine, until the kingdom of God comes. He took the bread, and he gave thanks, and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood which is poured out for you signifying that he would suffer and die on the cross shed his blood so that we could have forgiveness forgiveness for eternity that the original covenant couldn't do but that was a covenant that was given to Jesus that was a covenant by which we're all saved through which we find life and peace with God. The New Covenant will look like this, and I, I, this is from Jeremiah. It's funny, I've been preaching from, or speaking from, or sharing God's word from Isaiah all year. But it's interesting, I, you would have thought Isaiah would have got this promise of the New Covenant, but it wasn't. There was another prophet by the name of Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, they received these two covenants. One in Ezekiel is about dry bones. It's very interesting if you want to read it. But this new covenant is this. We read it once, but I will read it from the prophet Isaiah, from his writings. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. In other words, it's the prophecy about Jesus to come prophecy about the Messiah. This will be a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant that I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke that covenant. God kept his part, but people broke it. Even though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord, and so this is the new covenant. This is the covenant I will make with them now. And there's four things in this new covenant that we see we can be thankful for. Number one, he says, I will put my law in their minds and I will write it on their hearts. Interesting, when you look at the old, not, it's not an old covenant. Eugene Peterson puts it like this in the message. He said, the old covenant's still there, it's just up on the shelf collecting dust now. And I, I think that's a good way of putting it, because it's still there. But the new covenant is the one we want to be looking at. And he says, I will write it on their heart, and I will put my law in their minds. And you think about that, you know, the, the covenant that was given to Moses was 
was written with the finger of God upon that stone tablet. Well, God does the same thing with us when we receive Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. He writes His name on our heart. He engraves His love in our heart. We can't escape that. It's Holy Spirit written. He also puts it in our minds, and I'll talk about our minds and knowledge here in a second, because that was another part of this new covenant. The second part of the new covenant is, I will be their God, and they will be my people. They would, the two would become one through the new covenant. There would be peace with God. There would be forgiveness. A Holy Spirit deposits and guaranteeing God with us and in us. The third one, and, I, and I, I, I like this, because it's so true of, of, of our world and the teachings that are so scarred by people that don't have a clue what they're talking about. And he says this, no longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord. Know the Lord. That, that won't be anymore. He said, because they will all know me from the least of them to the greatest. In other words, anyone can know this. You don't have to be a theologian to know this. God said, I can write that on your heart. Think about Paul and his conversion. Paul knew the law. Paul knew every part of the law. Paul was, Paul was very obedient as a, as a Jew. And yet, once he, Christ, once he understood who Christ was, that he was the Messiah, that he died for his sins, and, he, and Jesus asked, why are you persecuting me? Why, why are you doing that? Because of the knowledge you have, you think you're right? He didn't say that, I said that. But that was a problem. And then even the Jews, you know, as they wrote down the law, they, if they ran into a problem they couldn't understand, they rewrote it. They made a way around it. It was ludicrous. It was crazy. He said, but that won't happen anymore. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say, you need to know your God. Well, you don't have to be a theologian. You just have to ask Jesus to come into your heart and to teach you. And he'll do it. <clears throat> Everyone, the least and the greatest, Holy Spirit taught. And the last thing is, for I will forgive their wickedness. You see, this couldn't really happen in the Old Covenant. It did happen. The, the priest, every year, they went up and offered bulls and sacrifices and blood and whatever they had to do for the forgiveness of the people's sins. There was a provision in there because God knew that they couldn't obey the law. But this was different, this new covenant. For in this new covenant, he says, I will forgive their wickedness. And this is important. I'll remember their waywardness no more. I won't even remember it. My sister was an Episcopal pastor in New Mexico, and she pastored in a federal penitentiary. And uh, she used to go out to the First Nations reserves. There were a lot of First Nation women that were in prison. She used to go out and minister there. And she went to one First Nations reserve and it was doing pretty good. Oh, wow, they weren't drinking anymore, they were going to church. What happened? And they said, well, we had a nun that was here, and she taught us about Jesus. She taught us about Jesus. Really? Yeah, but she went back to her archbishop, and he said, how's it going on that reserve? And she said, really good. He said, the people are, I'm teaching them about Jesus and they're, 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 <laughs> they're changing. They've given up drinking. A lot of them have 
go to church? He said, they're, they're just changed. He said, how could that be? He said, I don't know. Jesus does it. So this archbishop said to her, do you know this Jesus? And she said, yes, sir, I do. He said, how do you know him? He said, through his word and through his Holy Spirit that he's taught me. He said, okay, I've got a good question for you. I'll even give you some time to think about it. He said, when you come back next time, I want you to tell me the last sin I committed. She went back to the reserve and then she came back to the archbishop and she said, you still have a question for me? And he said, yeah, tell me. What's the last sin I committed? Did you ask Jesus? She said, yeah, I asked Jesus. What did he say? He said, I forgot. <laughs> I forgot. You know, often we get burdened by sin. It's terrible what we carry, even as Christians. But God tells us that those sins will be remembered no more. They're forgiven. They're wiped off. I better keep going here. I wrote this down so it would be simple. For I will forgive their sins and I will remember them no more. In the covenant of law, provision for forgiveness through the sacrifices was made. But now forgiveness by the blood of Christ shed on the cross would give forgiveness forevermore. <coughs> We're at the end here, summary. The last page you got after that is done. The covenant given to his children, to his creation, you know, even the covenant we read in the, in the Old Testament. The covenant was, was that just simply said, listen to my voice. Listen to my voice. I just want you to hear me. Obey my voice. That doesn't sound difficult. <laughs> Obey my voice. But God's children wouldn't and couldn't. Shoulda, woulda, coulda. Don't shoot on yourself. S-H-O-U-L-D. Shoulda, woulda, coulda. But the new covenant has forgiveness of sin divine power, faith, belief that overpowers any power of work that you could ever do. It's Holy Spirit powered. Was it possible for God to fulfill what he made and promised? Yes, but only through Jesus and the new covenant. Through Jesus, the Messiah, there was no sin. I think about that and I think, why just Jesus? And I thought, well, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, you cannot find sin in Christ. It's not there. No sin. He was who he said he was. He was the Messiah, the way and the truth and the life. He was resurrected. I think, I don't, how many people do I know that have been resurrected from the dead and ascended into heaven? Maybe in this life, but for eternity. But Jesus was resurrected. Who else can give me, a, touch my heart, touch my mind, and give me the Holy Spirit? Who can do that? It won't be the horoscope. Only God can do that through His Spirit. God in heaven, thank you for your word. I feel like Moses sometimes when I'm trying to share it. How much you love people. How much you care for people.
how much you want to forgive them and bring them into your kingdom. But I can't do that, God. You could do that. So I pray that that would happen. I pray that people would come and learn and know who you are. The Almighty God that gave us the one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Through him is forgiveness of sins that will be remembered no more. Where else can we go, God? But to you, I pray. In Jesus' name. Please stand if you can as we finish off with our last song. their sins and lawless acts I will remember no more. And where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for skin, for sin, is no longer necessary. I hope you all have a good year. May the Lord bless all of you and keep all of you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you each and every single one of you. But most of all, may the Lord turn his face towards you and give you that good and that everlasting peace that only Christ can give. God bless you. Have a great day.